Welcome to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today's focus is ESS Topic 3.3, Conservation and Regeneration. In this video, we're going to examine several key approaches to biodiversity conservation, with a particular focus on mixed conservation approaches, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and rewilding as a regeneration strategy. These approaches represent different ways that people attempt to protect and restore biodiversity, and they reflect different environmental perspectives and value systems. So let's get into it. We're going to start with the Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD. This international agreement represents one of the most significant global frameworks for conservation. The CBD is a UN treaty that addresses both species-based conservation, which focuses on protecting individual species, and habitat-based conservation, which aims to protect entire ecosystems where species live naturally. So what exactly is the CBD? It's an international agreement that helps countries protect nature. It was signed at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. The CBD has three main goals. First, to protect the variety of plants, animals, and ecosystems around the world. Second, to use natural resources in ways that don't harm them for future generations. And third, to make sure the benefits from using genetic resources like plants for medicine are shared fairly. CBD works by helping countries create their own national biodiversity strategies and action plans. It also establishes protected areas in the oceans beyond any country's territory, and that's especially important because international waters usually lack proper protection. A key component of the CBD is the Nagoya Protocol, which makes sure that when companies or researchers use genetic resources like plants with medicinal properties, the benefits are shared fairly with the communities where those resources came from. This prevents something called biopiracy, where local people are excluded from the profits or benefits of their traditional resources. The CBD uses both habitat-based and species-based conservation strategies. For habitat-based conservation, it helps countries create their own national plans to protect nature and establishes protected areas in the oceans beyond any country's territory. For species-based conservation, the Nagoya Protocol allows for the curation of genetic data through methods like captive breeding and seed banks. It ensures that benefits are shared fairly with the communities where those resources originated, and that respects their rights and their knowledge. Let's take a look at mixed conservation approaches. Sometimes a mixed conservation approach is adopted, where both habitat and particular species are considered. This combines the strengths of both in situ conservation, which protects species in their natural habitats, with ex situ conservation, where we're protecting species outside of their natural habitats, such as in zoos or seed banks. We saw that in our previous video. We're going to go through several case studies that demonstrate different approaches to conservation. I recommend you make notes about each of them so that you have named examples to reference on your exams. The Sichuan Giant Panda Reserve in China provide an excellent example of a mixed approach. These reserves protect endangered giant pandas and their bamboo forest habitat. The mixed approach includes large in situ reserves of bamboo forest, captive breeding programs, which are ex situ conservation, and ecological corridors that connect fragmented habitats. This mixed approach stabilizes panda populations, it increases the connectivity of their habitats, and it improves international cooperation. When evaluating this project, you can see successes like the panda's status being upgraded from endangered to vulnerable, successful captive breeding in zoos around the world, and expanded protected areas in China. However, challenges do remain, and that includes habitat fragmentation due to more development of infrastructure, and dependence on human intervention or reintroductions. Another example is the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, which spans the USA and Canada. This ambitious project connects 3,200 kilometers of protected areas between Yellowstone National Park in the US and the Yukon in Canada. It aims to conserve large-scale wildlife habitats and migration corridors for species like grizzly bears, wolves, and moose. This mixed approach focuses both on habitat preservation and ensuring the survival of specific species through habitat corridors. Benefits include maintaining ecosystem functions, providing species migration routes, and preventing habitat fragmentation. The initiative has seen success in species recovery, such as the grizzly bear population increasing, but it faces challenges like human wildlife conflict and ensuring the long-term viability of the corridors, especially when there's an extensive road network in both of those places. The Galapagos Islands Conservation Program in Ecuador showcases another mixed approach. Famous for its unique biodiversity, the Galapagos Islands conservation efforts here focus on both protecting the habitat and ensuring the survival of iconic species such as the Galapagos tortoise. The mixed approach includes invasive species removal, habitat restoration, and breeding programs for endangered species like the tortoises. Benefits include biodiversity conservation, reduced human impact, and the restoration of critical habitats. An evaluation shows successful management of invasive species, 
but challenges remain in the recovery of endemic species and balancing the demands of tourism that funds it with the actual purpose, which is conservation. The African Elephant Conservation Program across Sub-Saharan Africa demonstrates how several countries have adopted mixed conservation strategies for elephants. The approach combines habitat protection through national parks and reserves with efforts to reduce human-elephant conflict, anti-poaching measures, and community engagement. Benefits include long-term elephant survival, reduced human-wildlife conflict, and improved community relationships. Successes include decreased poaching rates, better community-based conservation, effectiveness of habitat corridors, and improved awareness of elephant value beyond ivory. Challenges, of course, include ongoing poaching for ivory, ineffective governance and monitoring, and human population pressure on protected sites. The Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation in Indonesia and Malaysia works on the conservation of the critically endangered Bornean orangutan. Their approach combines habitat restoration with the protection of individual orangutans. The mixed approach includes rehabilitation of orphaned orangutans and restoration of degraded forests. Benefits include species recovery, ecosystem restoration, and slower deforestation rates. While there has been success in orangutan population recovery and some forest restoration, there are big challenges combating illegal logging and powerful timber companies because the economic benefit of habitat loss usually outweighs that gained from conservation efforts. Kakadu National Park Conservation in Australia provides another example of mixed approach to conservation. This UNESCO World Heritage Site has rich biodiversity, particularly for species like the saltwater crocodile, the Dibiru stork, and various marine life. The mixed approach combines habitat protection, the conservation of key species, and the involvement of indigenous communities in its management. Benefits include preservation of biodiversity and cultural heritage and improved management through indigenous knowledge. Successes include managing invasive species like the buffalo, the effectiveness of community-based management, and species recovery. Challenges include difficult access, which limits ecotourism opportunities, and ongoing socioeconomic development issues within Aboriginal communities. The Maasai Mara conservancies in Kenya support diverse megafauna, including lions, elephants, and wildebeest. Wildlife migration corridors link to the Serengeti in Tanzania. Community conservancies combine habitat conservation with targeted species protection, such as lion monitoring. Local Maasai communities are involved in conservation tourism. Benefits include economic support for indigenous communities, the protection of key migration routes, and increased funding through ecotourism. This approach has led to stable lion populations, reductions in poaching, and improved habitat conditions, although some challenges remain with land use conflicts and uneven revenue distribution between the government, the private partnerships, and the Maasai communities. The Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve in Mexico protects the wintering grounds of millions and millions of migrating monarch butterflies. This mixed approach includes conservation of forests for habitat protection and enforcement against illegal logging and community-based ecotourism. Benefits include maintaining the butterfly migration cycles, supporting local livelihoods, and fostering international conservation efforts. Deforestation rates within the reserve have declined, and an awareness of butterfly conservation has also increased. However, climate change threatens migration patterns and deforestation continues outside the core protected areas. Rhino conservation in Southern Africa, particularly South Africa, addresses the severe threat to white and black rhino populations from poaching for their horns. The mixed approach includes anti-poaching patrols, rhino dehorning to reduce poaching incentives, and habitat protection through national parks. Benefits include stabilized rhino populations in some regions and better security in private reserves. Some rhino populations are recovering now, and new technology like drones helps in conservation. However, poaching remains a pretty serious threat, and there are really high costs that are associated with a bunch of these anti-poaching efforts. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Conservation in Australia protects the world's largest coral reef ecosystem, which is home to thousands of marine species. The mixed approach includes habitat protection through marine protected areas and restoration projects for key species like coral breeding programs. Benefits include maintaining marine biodiversity, supporting sustainable tourism and fisheries, and promoting climate resilience. While there are strong legal protections and promising coral restoration projects, the reef does face significant challenges from coral bleaching due to climate change and pollution from coastal development and agriculture. Now let's shift our focus to rewilding. Natural processes and ecosystems can be regenerated by rewilding, which is a conservation approach focused on restoring and protecting natural processes in wilderness areas, allowing them to function without significant human intervention. 
Rewilding is different from regeneration because regeneration usually involves some kind of human intervention to promote or support a particular part of an ecosystem. This rewilding diagram illustrates how rewilding addresses the global environmental emergency. The current problem shows a massive loss of biodiversity and climate change. Key drivers of that loss include human resource use, loss of natural habitats, rising pressure inside natural areas, and loss of natural processes, as well as release of greenhouse gases. The solution is to restore large areas to high functional value for biodiversity through rewilding. The outcome includes enhanced, resilient capacity for biodiversity across large areas and substantial increases in carbon sequestration. That means we make ecosystems and populations more resilient and more resistant to change and better able to recover from human interference. The ultimate goal is global ecological sustainability, which maintains Earth's biodiversity and simultaneously reduces climate change. The Hinawai Reserve in New Zealand provides an excellent example of rewilding. This project targets native forest regeneration, including tree ferns and podocarps, while supporting native bird species like bellbirds and caribou. Methods include the cessation or blocking of livestock grazing and logging, natural reforestation, the control of invasive species, and minimal human intervention. Successes include rapid natural regeneration of native vegetation, the return of many native bird species, and overall an increase in biodiversity. Some of the limitations include ongoing challenges with invasive species and initial skepticism from the local farming community. The Hinawai is kind of like a biodiversity island surrounded by farmland. The Yellowstone National Park rewilding project in the USA targeted the gray wolf as an apex predator to restore ecosystem balance. Methods included reintroducing the wolves to control elk population, and that led to trophic cascades that, that had effects benefiting vegetation, beavers, other species, and even the flow of water within Yellowstone. Successes included increased biodiversity, healthier riparian zones along those rivers, and the resurgence of species like beavers and songbirds. Some of the limitations include continued human wildlife conflict because farmers and ranchers outside of the park view the wolves as predators for their livestock, and so they exert political resistance. And there's also some slow ecosystem recovery in some areas. Carafren Wildwood in Scotland focuses on native woodland restoration in the southern uplands and the reintroduction of missing species such as red squirrels and raptors. Methods include cessation of sheep farming, that means they stopped farming sheep, a large-scale tree planting operation, and habitat connectivity improvement. The before and after images here show 22 years of progress through rewilding. Successes include rapid afforestation or growth of forest, improved biodiversity, and increased community involvement in conservation efforts. Some of the limitations include the long timescale for full forest restoration and dependence on active management to prevent the reappearance of invasive species. Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique targets large herbivores like elephants and buffalo, apex predators like lions, and overall savanna ecosystem recovery. Methods include the reintroduction of key species, anti-poaching efforts, and community involvement in conservation. Successes include significant increase in wildlife populations, local employment through ecotourism, and improved overall ecosystem health. Some of the limitations include ongoing challenges around poaching, habitat degradation due to climate change, and a continued need for human intervention to maintain that progress. Finally, the European bison rewilding in the Carpathian Mountains in Romania focuses on the European bison. Methods include the reintroduction of bison into their former range, efforts to connect their habitat, and educating local communities. Successes include growing wild bison populations, increased ecosystem resilience, and benefits from ecotourism. Some of the limitations include a risk of human-wildlife conflict, concerns about genetic diversity within the bison populations, and reliance on continued funding. That's it for ESS Topic 3.3, Conservation and Regeneration. These case studies demonstrate how a combination of species-based ex situ strategies and habitat-based in situ strategies, such as rewilding, can effectively conserve biodiversity and promote ecosystem regeneration. Make sure you remember details about at least a few of these case studies as you prepare for your exams. Until next time, happy learning.